Oh, hey there. The episode you're about to watch was a lot of fun to record. Uh, Costa Nico and myself talk about medical robots, uh, what it's like coming up in a startup, and a lot of interesting other topics and war stories get covered here. Uh, before we begin, everybody should know that the views in this episode are those of Costa and myself only, and not those of Costa's employer, Smith & Nephew Robotics. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Costa Nico. Costa is a senior principal engineer at Smith & Nephew Robotics and all-around great guy. Costa, welcome to the pod. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction, Spencer. Oh, you're welcome, Costa. <laughs> Happy to say it. Now, I've been enjoying getting to know you, um, and so I, I appreciate you coming on and doing this, and uh, yeah, excited to kind of dig more into your, your professional career. Cool. I hope I won't bore you too much. Yeah, just a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> so... I, I was looking at your LinkedIn and you were telling me um, you went from like a management track at Smith back to like an individual contributor track, which I, I've not seen a whole lot of people do. Right. So you were a senior director first and then you went to um, senior principal engineer. What, I guess, what made you want to do that and what's it been like? Like what's the parallel and difference in those in those positions? Yeah, so I, I when I was at Smith and Nephew, um, I had, when we got acquired in 2016, I was running the software organization at, at Blue Belt. Uh, and so um, I became the, the director of software engineering there. Um, and uh, I was there in that role for, for a little while and it was great because software is kind of how I was trained and that was you know the thing I had done all my life. Uh, but the opportunity came up you know, to move into systems engineering, which was kind of a new discipline within Smith & Nephew. Right? Smith & Nephew traditionally isn't kind of a, a super kind of technical company. It's an implant company, a medical device company. And so I think systems engineering was fairly new and, and some of our leadership had come from other organizations that, that had established systems engineering teams. It makes sense. Uh, and, and so they, they wanted to, to start this discipline within our robotics group where the systems engineering function kind of existed more in the management, right? So as a startup, everybody wears multiple hats and you kind of collaborate on the design. And when you have one design, everybody kind of rallies around that because there's one product. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, but you know, when you're growing, you're trying to advance. You you want to have people in place for multiple projects, multiple um, portfolio um, elements that that can kind of drive the systems engineering sort of aspect. Where management is more about management as opposed to kind of technical leadership. Uh, and so, I, I believe that I'm kind of extrapolating based on kind of the history of how everything went through. But at the end of the day, uh, I took over that organization and started to kind of put that together. Um, the systems engineering systems organization. engineering organization. So you know we found the people within the organization that were kind of well suited for doing the sorts of things that we thought we that they needed to do, uh, and so I moved into managing that role. And you know as much as I liked the people and I and I really believed in the, the concepts around that and, and really felt really as that I was a systems engineer in my position and in, in my role over the years, I, the the management aspect of 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 bringing people in and, and having my job to be to setting people up for success in the job that I enjoy doing myself, yeah. especially when it was kind of separated a bit from the software side, which was kind of my, more of my passion. Yeah. I was just kind of too many degrees removed from the detail work. That makes and sense. For me, it was more like, you know, there is a track of leadership and team development and whatnot. And, and, and I, you know, enjoy that somewhat. Like I felt that I was too far away from the detail work, which I really enjoy. Yeah, it wasn't my job to dictate the design. It was my job to establish people in place to feel that they were empowered to develop design. That I wanted to have more of a detail work. work yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Involved. So I, I had this, you know, kind of remarkable opportunity to go back and work under Branko, who Branko Yarmas, who was was my, has been my mentor and my my boss essentially since I was twenty something years old. <laughs> uh, and I could tell that story if, if, if you ask, but yeah, um, that. At, at the end of the day, working with him where I used to kind of live vicariously through the work he was doing, which was the kind of front end research, early concept development stuff that I really enjoyed. Uh, so it was an opportunity to move under him and do that work a little bit more directly. Still as a technical leader, still as kind of a, a, a subject matter expert, but just a little bit more responsible for actually doing the work. Yeah, right? it makes sense. Where I don't feel guilty if I'm writing a little code in that job, but as the systems or sorry, as a senior director of systems engineering in a medical device company, doing writing code isn't my job. Yeah, I could sense. make it my job if I wanted to, but it, it, again, I didn't feel like it was a great fit. And so just talking with our leadership and, and, and everything, 
um, you know, I, they gave me the opportunity to move laterally in that way, and it's been great. That's awesome. Yeah. So just to take a step back, I guess, for people listening, um, Smith & Nephew Robotics uh, used to be, I guess, and please correct me if I'm wrong here, a company called Blue Belt Technologies. Blue which, Belt Technologies, that's right. Yeah, and you were with them for, I want to say, like 13 years? Before. So Blue Belt was started, I, I, depending on who you ask, it was 2003 or 2004. Cool. I think it was like, for me, it's 2004, January 2004, which is when um, I was the first person to take a paycheck from that organization. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, so I was employee number one. I like to t tell everybody that because um, <laughs> it's a great tagline. But, but, but essentially, it, you know, Blue Belt was one of the startups that came out of the medical robotics lab at CMU. So we had the, it's technically was the medical robotics and computer assisted surgery lab. Mr. Cass was the acronym. <laughs> and, uh, you know, our team there were kind of really on the cutting edge of, of computer assisted surgery, specifically in orthopedics, you know, the, the world's first kind of computer assisted hip surgery system for, for hip orthoplasty was, was founded by our group. That's awesome. So great award-winning research. Dr. DeJoya, who's still a practicing surgeon here today, founded the lab. Uh, Branko, Dr. Yermaz, was the co-founder of that group. And we just had an excellent group of, of Robotics Institute guys kind of making Does Branko have an MD or is, is Branko has a PhD. PhD. That's what I thought. Civil okay, just making sure. Um, and actually, Dr. DeJoya also has a a, a engineering degree as well. And cool. We took that and went to med school. Uh, so, you know, the early work in that was around orthopedics and hip surgery, uh, and, and that actually spawned a couple of startups. The first one was was a company called Casurgica um, that was trying to, to spin off the hip nav work, uh, and so that was the first startup out of our lab. And and I had joined that for a little while. I think it was around two thousand one. I joined that, uh, where some of my friends and some of my lab mates had join earlier on and, and so as most of these sort of startups that come out of the university so there's this sort of like you know symbiotic slash incestuous relationship with the labs <laughs> yep. and, the, and comp uh, the companies and the grant funding and all that all of these are funded by the sbir uh, programs Inter i didn't know that Would yeah that be, uh, nih stuff? The nih sbr yeah. i think we had a we may have had an nsf grant or Makes two sense. Um, but most of the time I spent early on in, in the company was writing SBIR grants to get money, 100 grand at a time. Pretty cool. And so we really bootstrapped the company, both companies, with these sorts of grants. I had I, no idea. Yeah, I had moved to Casurgica uh, earliest, and, and we had a couple of active grants. And then as the Blue Belt technology uh, was spun out of CMU, there was a student named Gabe Brisson, who was a PhD student, came up with this idea of this handheld smart drill that would cut the bone you're supposed to and not cut the bone you're not supposed to. Um, so that was his PhD thesis. He submitted the patent, CMU's great text transfer. That's group. the Navio. Yeah, which became Navio. Yeah, um, cool. And it was a technology called PFS, and you can pick your acronym for what PFS stands for. Uh, for us, <laughs> it was precision freehand sculpting. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was an idea that we worked on from, two, like, I mean, he worked on it before the company had really kind of gained traction as a PhD student, uh, but we, we took it on in 2004 and really just survived on grant research, sponsored corporate research, um, some local tech development investment, um, and just kept the company alive until we really got some traction and got some real funding from some local angel investors and eventually some capital equity out of New York. Cool. And that was around, like, and I should know the dates better. But was that around when Craig came in or would that have been? No, no, Craig was the CEO of Blue Belt from the very beginning. Okay, and I didn't realize So Craig that. and I shared a hot pink office uh, above a check cashing place in Bloomfield <laughs> across the street from West Penn Hospital where our sister lab was. Uh, it was basically converted office space. I think I know the building you're talking about actually. Yeah, so there was a check, so across yeah. from West Penn, there was a check cashing place. It, it's across the side street is Lombardozzi's restaurant, if that is still there. Mr. Lombardozzi was our landlord. Nice. Uh, and we had this space, and it was it was clearly old apartment space that had been converted. But Craig's in the main office was, I don't want to say hot pink, it was more of a light pink, uh, <laughs> where he had his room, we had a conference room, and I was in one of the like bedrooms down the hall where my office was. Nice. Uh, and, and we worked on both uh, Casurgica stuff and, and Blue Belt stuff until... Um, Ultimate Casurgica ran out of money and ran out of time and ran out of funding and ran out of interest. Uh, uh, and Blue Belt had legs, right? So we yeah. got a phase two grant from there and were able to continue. To just just to clarify, what were the primary differentiators be differentiators between the tech at Casurgica and Blue Belt? Yeah, so Casurgica was all around computer-assisted 
total hip replacement surgery, okay. navigation, preoperative 3D planning, things that are now 20 years later catching on in the market and it's successful. We were too early. It's a classic story of an idea that's too early. Yeah. Um, trying to shop around where you say, yeah, and you get a CT scan, we can plan your custom plan for you and, and your joint and your patients or whoever you're talking to. Why would I want to do they that? Say, they say, why you don't need a CT scan for hip surgery? It doesn't make any sense. Fast forward to today, all of the fanciest systems, for <laughs> instance, the biggest competitor, Mako from Stryker, forces you to have a CT scan. And of course, why wouldn't you have a CT scan for your, <laughs> for your replacement surgery? It's Regardless of kind of trends in reimbursement and costs and radiation and all those sorts of things, it's just one of those things that's just 20 years ahead of its time. Yeah. So that was Cosurgica and it was a failure. Um, but you know, it's, you can look back on it and, and see that it was a tremendous success from the standpoint of being really the first to start to, 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 you know, socialize these ideas around kind of the next level of, of what you should consider when you're doing hip replacement. Cool. Blue belt was all around this handheld device. Okay. And so it started in knee surgery. But wouldn't you need some kind of planning to figure out where to put that device or am I? Uh, so yeah, you do. Okay. You, so the idea, um, is. And maybe just to kind of rewind for some of your listeners and viewers, sure. uh, knee replacement um, traditionally is done with a bunch of jigs. So you can see my knee here. So surgeons go through and depending on the instrumentation, either kind of eyeball or put a rod up your femur and it aligns to some axis. And there are a bunch of averages that are built into the tools. So, yeah. you know, the average tilt from your anatomic femoral canal axis to the mechanical axis of your knee is three degrees. So they do a cut of three degrees relative to this rod that they put in your femur and they make that cut. And then from that yeah. cut, they have other adjustments that allow you to put the instruments on in a very average way. Right. Yeah, and, they're, and they do a lot of studies and design to make sure that that works pretty well for most people. And the better surgeons, more experienced surgeons can kind of tweak the plans as they go, partially based on their experience or some kind of cutting guys that can be adjustable, but also partially by kind of, once they've made their cuts and they put the implants on, they change the soft tissue by kind of releasing the ligaments. So cutting the ligaments to make them a little looser and they fill it with metal and plastic in order to get everything to align pretty well. Oh, cool. But it's not cool because the issue is you didn't grow up that way, right? So your knee grew and developed in a particular way. So you're and changing you, the kinematics You're changing patient. the kinematics of the knee. And so, so yeah. you know, as you kind of align to these general averages for everybody, it may not align to you as a patient. And so, you know, the current feeling is that, uh, and this is, you know, the, the field is moving in this direction that you should take more consideration around how your knee was and, and the, the kinematics of your natural knee and, and, and make plan according to that. And so that's why the ideas of imaging and, and such come in. And, and certainly some sort of planning. So yeah. with imaging, you can do preoperative planning. You can say, okay, here's my CT scan or my MRI scan. I'm looking at the geometry. I'm gonna put my implant here relative to the bone shape that I see on the screen. And you can translate that into the operating room with a number of different tools. Yeah. Uh, what we've done with, with Blue Belt to start, uh, with Navio, which was the first, uh, the name of the system under Blue Belt, uh, and then ultimately the second generation, which is something we call Cori. Again, same idea, just a new platform is that you can actually build the models that you need in surgery interoperatively. So you can avoid the need to do a preoperative scan because, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in, interoperatively you can paint the surface of the bone with tracked pointed probes and build a big enough 3D shape and do other kind of collections to give you that model without having a scan. So to take a step back, uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. When you say paint the surface of the bone, um, Without imaging, how do you do that exactly? So everything that we do and everything that all the systems that are in this space do is they use some sort of external, I would say probably all of them. There may be, there's a couple of them that use different sort of sensing, but most of them you rely on optical tracking technology. Okay, got so it. Very much like motion capture and, and, and movie animation. It's like, like IR markers. They use IR markers. Uh, some of them are active, some of them are passive, but essentially these are equipped to the tools which are calibrated so that as you move this around in the view of the camera, the camera knows where this is in three-dimensional space relative to it. You also have markers built into the patients? And we put markers built into the patients. So we build uh, instrumentation that allows you to 
uh, as minimally invasively as possible, put, put pins in your leg, like external fixation hardware, yeah. that for the duration of the surgery will hold the tracker in place in view of the camera. And then those are removed, of course, when the surgery is done. Yeah. But, but that, that allows you to necessary. move, to track the bone as you move it around. And when I say painting, you take a calibrated pointer and you run it over the surface of your joint and that builds a point cloud relative to that tracked tracker. Oh, cool. And so now so you once have- once the patella is off and the knee is open. Once the knee is open, you map that. Okay, so, got it. So the conversation, I don't know, I, I don't remember if-, if so She more or less doing like a slam of the femur? Yeah, yeah, I'd say so, but I mean, it's not completely slammed, but you are building a point cloud, and yeah. it is relative to this. So with slam, you're building a reference frame as you go, right? Yeah. We have an established reference frame with this. Yeah, with those attached. markers that are both. So you're basically, camera. you're kind of, if, if it was a laser striper, then you would be building it that way, but we do it as a touch probe. It's like a CMS. You're doing CMS oh, okay, of, cool. of, of your knee with the reference frame attached to your leg, and you do that Got on it. both and, the, and the, the probe also has a uh, IR uh, Marker exactly. on it, exactly so right. exactly. the external camera can see both relative right. to each other. Right. Okay, and these cool. cameras are sub millimetric in their, in their resolution, pretty awesome. in their accuracy. So, when well, I've know, seen CMMs that work that way, the handheld ones with the okay, so it's right. Based so, on some of the companies that build the same technology that is used in these types of surgeries also build uh, metrology equipment, makes uh, sense. And, and, and so, our original uh, device, the Navio device, relied on the company uh, and a product called the Northern Digital Polaris, um, the Certus. Uh, was an earlier version of that, and they used that to kind of like, you know, laser strike your car door to make sure it was within spec, right? So there's a whole metrology wing in those companies that were built up. But and laser stripe, divisions. is that is that akin to physically touching, or is that...? Uh, yeah, so, sorry, I'm kind of throwing out these terms there. No so worries. Some of these, some of these devices um, allow you to have a, a, a kind of a laser rangefinder attached with one of those markers. Okay, okay. So I can... Uh, this is a, it's a stripe that basically shows you where you're aiming, but you can kind of paint using you know, an IR laser to measure the Got point it. cloud relative to the handheld unit, which is also being tracked. So you can build a, a 3D point cloud. And it's like a one-dimensional LiDAR, basically. They're actually two-dimensional, so that's why it's, okay. it's a stripe, because you can take a strip. Uh, I see. And, and some of the newer CMM machines, like the Faro Arm, come with these laser laser gun modules That's that pretty you can cool. put on the end. And so, so when you mentioned a CMM, I thought of a physical like probe that touches right, off, and it right. sounds like you're talking about a 2D uh, well, laser system. So ours is not 2D. Uh, we are using a single point probe. It's a ball okay. probe, and we're collecting things. Got it. So you're um, physically touching off the bone. You're physically touching the bone. And there's a, yeah. there's a foot pedal that the surgeon uses to say, I'm collecting, or it releases the pedal when I'm not collecting. That makes uh, sense, because there's probably a lot of other clutter around that you don't want to paint. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, um, if you were, for instance, just using some sort of optical scanning, you get all the soft tissues, you get the patella, you get the other bone in the that joint. And, and so it's it's kind of prohibitive right now to kind of automatically throw out all that data. Now, you know, with, with advances in AI and machine learning and, and all that sort you of thing. You can infer what's femur and what isn't. You can do a lot better, and there are groups tibia. working on that yeah. sort of thing where you can just have some magical scanning device that just looks at the joint and says, this is what your femur is, this is what your tibia is, and we know where they are. Yep. We're not quite there yet, um, yeah. but everyone's working on that sort of technology because Pretty it cool. prevents the having to paint. But suffice yeah. to say, painting doesn't take a long time, yep. right? You know, only less than a minute in the operating room of you painting the bone to give you a 3D map of your joint yep. is, in, you know, in a lot of ways, way better than sending someone off to get a CT scan. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Right? The radiation burden is lower. The uh, ability to, to to not put the patient through the burden of having to go and get take their script to an imaging center, right? Yeah. Uh, all of the and the costs, of course, associated. With that. Yeah. Um, a minute in the operating room is is worth it. And, well, and, it's and also, streamlined if it's just on the front end of the surgery, you just paint and keep going. Right, right. So um, that that takes very little time uh, in in the Cori system, uh, and and we've worked. I mean, we did seven iterations of Navio, and then we're on our probably third or fourth iteration of Cori at this point, continually trying to address the needs of patient of surgeons to to be more efficient in the, in the operating room. So workflow changes, algorithmic changes, all those sorts of things. Awesome. But essentially, getting back to your point is that what you have this model, as the 3D model, as well as like a kinematic model, because we can bend the leg and move it around during yeah. surgery and map how the joint is moving preoperatively. Yeah. We can use all that information to say, okay, now I can tell you in the relative to a 3D model where I should put my implant. Yeah, uh, but isn't like, okay, so this is me being a lay person now sure. and I actually, 
don't you do a replacement because the joint's like a little bit messed up and not exactly doing what it's supposed to? So is there some right. error in that initial kinematic data you collect? So, so there is wear typically. So an yeah. big joint typically yeah. wear away the cartilage and sometimes you get osteophyte growth so it kind of makes the joint grow. So that would change your, your pivot point essentially. It can right? change your pivot point, but the, the idea is that surgeons have a general idea of how much cartilage they would want to build back. Okay. Depending on the surgery, there's either a reference to the other side of the joint or just a general understanding. And we do some other things as well to make that less critical. Okay. We do some kind of ligament um, stress analysis that kind of figures out the tensions of the surrounding soft tissue. So awesome. regardless of how the original joint was, you can actually move the kinematics around a little bit from a very service perspective and yeah. still get back to the same general kinematics that the joint was because the implants were shaped a little bit differently than the original bones were. Okay. Um, and, and every surgeon has a, has a kind of a different philosophy in how they want to manipulate the, the kinematics in that way. Um, but you know, suffice to say, you have a lot more information and a lot more kind of fine-tuned control, especially with the smart handpiece, um, to cut the surfaces where they're supposed to go relative to that interoperative plan um, or preoperative plan if we wanted to do it that way. Yeah. Uh, rather than just aligning to a three degree average for every single patient. Yeah, it makes sense. Right. Yeah, three degrees is pretty, now that you're saying it and you're describing the alternative, yeah, that's a wide variance, I guess. Right, or... right. Yeah, I, I, I like to say like, we want to measure once, cut once, instead of measure once, cut once, measure again, cut some more, <laughs> which is a, a lot of the surgeries out there where you, know, you get to the point where you make your first cuts and then you start doing adjustments based on the feel. And a lot of the surgical art is learning how a joint feels and what you do to adjust from that point. Yeah. Um, the, in, the, in, the manual instruments get you to a starting point and then a good surgeon will know how to adapt from there. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So we're trying to make good surgeons obsolete by making everything <laughs> technology based uh, and, and, and optimized. Uh, yeah. But you know, we haven't solved all the problems yet. You know, it's still a progress. It's only until, um, you know, really this decade have we been able to kind of precisely put the joints in and track them over time and, and, and do the sorts of kind of big data sort of analysis to see, you know, for this particular patient, for this particular surgery, for this particular implant, how did they do? And then learn from that. Oh, so you're looking at outcomes like years yeah, down the road. Yeah, the, the field has moved in the direction of what we called way back in the 90s, closing the loop. Nice. So the idea <laughs> is that you do preoperative planning, interoperative execution, you record all that, you look at the outcomes, and then you learn from that loop instead of waiting 10 years for the joints to fail, looking at an x-ray and guessing what went wrong, right? Yeah. Which is kind of the old way to do it. I um, mean, that also seems like closing the loop. <laughs> right. So yeah. um, th that's kind of the promise of today's orthopedic surgery. So a lot yeah. of the advent of robotics and other sorts of technologies has allowed you to know what you did and then kind of the outcome studies and the big data allows you to assess what you did a lot more quickly. That's cool. And then when Ken Yurish came in and did this podcast, he said something really similar last time, which right. is that, you know, that you're really seeing the outcomes get improved with the modern technology. Right. Yeah, you just have so much more control relative to those manual instruments. And the implants can become a lot more sophisticated because you can look in and really appreciate those novel designs that are even trickier to put in. You can put them in well because, again, you have all that more information. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And okay, this is, I'm probably going to sound dumb, but what is Cori? Like, I, I know the Navio product is a handheld drill. So, Cori is the same concept. Um, Cori was just kind of a, a level up in the design and the capability. So, Cori is essentially Navio faster, stronger, better, better looking um, than Navio was. Uh, Navio was. It's a second iteration handheld tool. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a ground up redesign of all of the hardware. Uh, cool. So, one example Navio was based on an existing spinal drill that was off the shelf. So there was a company uh, called Onspock that made spinal drills, a smaller company, and small enough to be interested to work with a company like Bluebell. Yeah, makes sense. Um, this company founded by a surgeon who didn't like the drill he was using, <laughs> so he designed his own surgical drill, and because surgeons could do that sort of thing, and he used it and they built a company around it and was very successful. Uh, and uh, so as a four-person company at Bluebell at the time, we didn't have the wherewithal to design a surgical spinal drill. So it was drill. you, Ken, Branco, and who else? Uh, it was me, Branco, Craig, uh, our first mechanic. Oh, sorry, Craig. My yeah, apologies. Yeah, Craig. Why is it Ken? Ken and, and Craig, look, they look very similar. So. Yeah. They... <laughs> uh, it was, Craig was the CEO. Branco was the CTO. I was the software engineering lead. Uh, our robotics lead, our electrical engineering lead, was Jim Moody. 
Okay, uh, I don't know yet. Yeah, was, uh, and, and Jim uh, was out of CMU. He worked with us in the lab. And then the first mechanical engineer that we hired full-time was Adam Hahn. He ran our mechanical cool. engineering. Uh, and so the five of us um, were kind of the first kind of technical leads um, to kind of realize the design. That's awesome. And then we hired uh, some other folks on the software side and the mechanical side to kind of build up the team as a little bit as a time like all startups go. There was yeah. no massive hiring push. There was no huge influx of capital where we got to go and triple the size of the team. It was very Not even important. the acquisition? Or? Well, the acquisition, uh, there was no mandate for growth after the acquisition, but that was by the time we were 150 people, we were selling product at that point. Uh, and um, at the acquisition, we were bought by a company that you know, probably didn't know a whole lot to do with the robotics company, right? They were an orthopedics company. Yep. And so they left us alone, I think to their credit. Nice. And, and they supported us and they gave us a little bit of direction from like, this is what we want to do next for the product. But there wasn't like, a, okay, you know, as guys get bigger. That yeah. came a little later with a change in leadership at Smith & Nephew. Um, but uh, at that point in time, there wasn't a significant uh, desire to get bigger, just to get the, the total need product to market and, and, and get there, because we were kind of in the middle of developing our, our, our total need platform. Awesome. Um, but yeah, at the time, whenever we designed Navio, um, we built it to, to use is that. Is Navio just thing. partials, by the way? Partial needs? Or? So we started with partials, but we ended okay. up doing total needs. Okay, cool. Um, the, 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 um, the surgical drill platform that we adopted, we piggybacked on top of that. So essentially for the first iteration of the commercial Navio, which was probably the sixth or seventh kind of concept design that we went through. Like we went through, we had the ugly tool, the, um, <laughs> the clutch tool, the G drill, the B drill, the, uh, the, what, the mean, ugly tool. We had all kinds of names because there were, everything was slightly different. Like, we had, so the concept, and maybe I, maybe I can explain a little bit better. The concept of PFS or Navio or Cori, the handheld, what we call now precision milling, is that we control the cutting, not with a big robot arm that comes and holds the tool. So yeah. some of our competition has this big robot arm that holds a cutting tool, and the surgeon pushes that robot arm around, and the robot keeps you honest. It pushes against you when you're not supposed to do something. Oh, that's interesting. And so it's a... It's a, it's a um, uh, high, it's a semi-active. The Doctor Strange love hand. Yeah. So yeah. Like, don't, don't move it. Right. <laughs> well, that's essentially what some of these robots are doing, right? You move it, and you have freedom to move it until the robot thinks you shouldn't move it, and then yeah. they create a force field. They call it haptics. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and, it, and it works. And it works fine, right? But it requires a big, strong arm in the operating room. Yeah. Um, what we do with with Navio and Corey is instead of it, it, it's a it's, it's like a pencil, right? You hold yep. this thing and you cut, it's like a surgical drill, uh, except whenever you're not supposed to cut in that area because it's against the surgical plan, it pulls the burr back or, oh, cool. or it shuts the burr off. So we have two different modes of operation. One is basically it will shut the burr off or it'll slow the burr down based on how far you are from where you're supposed to be cutting. Yeah. We call that speed control. That's awesome. The other control we call exposure control where there's a guard that covers the end of the, the burr and then when you're supposed to cut, it sticks out the amount that you're supposed to cut. So oh, if you're nice. supposed to cut five millimeters, it sticks out five millimeters. Pretty cool. If you're supposed to cut a half a millimeter, it sticks out a half a millimeter. Nice. And it does this at the frame rate of our camera, which is over 300 times a second. So it's adjusting to that uh, very rapidly, taking the tracking information. And, and the guard deploying figuring, and retracting is as opposed to the actual burr having to move. Actually, the burr is actually moving. Oh, okay. And that's one of the innovations going from Navio to Cori. Um, but we... One of the drills, the G drill, was the guard is moving drill, okay. right? As opposed to some of its successors where the burr was actually moving. Oh, G for guard, B for burr. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like, actually, I think B was for Branco. Uh, nice. But, <laughs> but anyway. Um, it's a hilarious naming convention. <laughs> every day is a different, different name. Yep. But the, the, the ch trick with Navio is because we were a four-person company, we couldn't build a, a high-speed surgical drill. This is something that spins at 60,000, eight, actually the on spot drill spin at 80,000 RPM wow. as a complete motor controller, fully medical device. That's really challenging created, to do, like right. just from an engineering perspective. Right, sterilizable, Yeah. you know, modular with a whole range of burrs, et cetera. We couldn't build that with our four person company and make it robotic, Yeah. right? So we basically made a housing that took their drill and moved their drill relative to the guard. Yeah. And so much, much easier thing to do from a design perspective I can't say it's a lighter lift because now you're moving this full 
off the shelf drill, so there's a lot of mass there. And yeah. So the responsiveness of that of the Navio was limited by the physics of having to move this drill. Around. Makes a lot of sense. And you know, you you have you have to adopt around some other company's design, and we had a great partnership. Uh, but it's not the same as controlling design yourself. So you don't yeah. have the sort of tolerances you would want in, in, a, in a really high, pre high precision uh, device. So it was certainly capable, but it, you couldn't squeeze as much performance as we would have liked out of that. Design. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And that's where Corey kind of levels up. Corey is complete, owned by Smith & Nephew, designed internally. We make everything from the burrs all the way down um, to the thing that holds the burr. Sweet. And, and, and you know, of course, we, we use some servo motors in there to, to drive things. Um, and we don't wind those ourselves. We do buy our motors from someone else. But <laughs> everything else is packaged and done in the design that we've designed. And it's and we move just the burr, so it's very fast. That's awesome. And so since it's fast, it can be more aggressive. So the motor is stationary, but the burr is moving. The, the burr moves in and out, and that's, the motors are inside the house. Sounds mechanically interesting. It's mechanically interesting, and that's one of the things. That's why we have smart people working on on just this, and we worked a long time on proving the concept and getting it to market. You're doing that at 80,000 RPMs? You're able we, to Corey scope spends your... at 60,000 RPMs. But even still, to be able which to... Which is still pretty fast, especially to be moving like is, something. Is that like a swash plate in a helicopter, how that would work? Like, uh, so I don't know what you just said, because I'm a software guy. Touche. But I'm not gonna talk about kind of internal design uh, no worries. elements as well. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, if you're interested kind of offline, you know, we could probably put you in touch with somebody that knows a little yeah, bit more be, about that. Yeah, be awesome. But uh, uh, the, um, it was hard, and, and, and yeah. we, we built it, and, and uh, so Corey's great, and, and like I said, uh, not only you know is the performance higher, but you know we, we threw some better ergonomics on, we changed the way we've mounted the tracker, so it's just it's just a really great uh, great improvement, and the customers really like it. That's awesome. So, so that's but that's you know something that we I mean, the design that went into Navio was probably, geez, 2011, 20. 2010 maybe where we had that design kind of in its provable um provable design that like we were doing trials with it um and we got fda approval in actually we're coming up on the 10 year anniversary uh 2013 it only took sorry, three years to get through FDA approval. I've always heard that was like a decade long process. No, because you employ something that's called the 510k process. So 510k. So if you do a pre-market approval which involves clinical trials, you're doing very kind of like fundamental proof that something is safe and effective. <coughs> um, the 5K process, and if you go and you watch the uh, the Bleeding Edge documentary on Netflix, they talk a lot about the 510K oh, process, and they vilify it. They, it. they leave this like this terrible process that creates all this risk because the companies can be very sloppy in their work. Right? <laughs> it, it's actually a boon to medical device companies that want to put out uh, incremental changes to technology or improvements, but not fundamentally um, from the standpoint of risky and unknown, right? So okay, 510K so I... allows you to say, my device is as safe and effective as a device that's already proven on the market, right? Yeah. So you could say, we are making something that's a competitor to this. There isn't a fundamental, there's, there, there's no thing that's so different that makes this riskier and less effective than this existing design. So you're going off of like, okay, this has already been through FDA trials. We're going to start there and then we'll prove the variances from that. Right. So okay, um, variations, I guess. So let's, let me try it off the top of my head, come up with a really silly example, right? Um, you know, Toyota Camry is released as a medical device in the market, <laughs> right? And okay. I want to, I want to sell a, a Honda Civic. You know, we don't have an FDA approval for a Honda Civic, but I can look, look, look at this thing. The engine's about the same. They both, you turn the steering wheel, the wheels move. We have airbags. <laughs> we four-wheel drive. Oh, they're a four-wheel drive. The gas tank is on the right, but it, theirs is on the left, and that, but that's okay because fundamentally, you know, it doesn't affect things. Like you basically lay out a case to say, we've proven that the, from a performance standpoint, from a fundamental kind of technology stack standpoint, we aren't any, different or riskier than products you've already approved. So was the was the base product, as it were, like the Camry in your example, the spinal drill that the technology was built off of? No, um, our, our product, there, there were existing robotic systems out there that had similar specs to ours. I'm being a little cagey because I don't know how, I don't know that it matters, but uh, suffice to say that there are other robots on, in the, in the uh, 
in the field that were um, approved for the same target application that we had, uh, we were able to show that we could meet the same accuracy specs. Sure. Uh, and, and so you kind of lay that out there, and you say this is, and you claim this is our predicate. This is why we're no different, and the FDA kind of judges things based on that. That makes sense. I mean, this is it's probably fine to tell you, but yeah, I don't want to screw up uh, no and worries. say the wrong thing. But at the end of the day, um, that's a process that a lot of medical devices leverage. And in that that documentary, you know, I think to its credit, but also again in, in a very kind of alarmist way, um, put out this sort of chain of events that says that, you know, this, uh, this uh, drill that you're, lets you put holes in someone's head was an eventual chain of predicates relative to this Band-Aid, right? There is this, Wait, this really? is, like, that's the like story that they tell. They show stretch. that there's a very kind of thin thread from one device to another over time. And, and so I recommend the documentary because the bleeding it's, edge. it's called Bleeding Edge. To check that um, out. But they talk about some devices that are, are fairly problematic and, and they lay examples about how that process. I've been looking for a new thing to watch on Netflix. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a pretty good one. Though, again, for folks in the medical device industry, we're just like, oh God. <laughs> because it makes, it makes stuff like what we're doing, which is, you know, totally above board. Um, look shady look shady right like like for every company they're doing the same similar thing to have to spend the time and the effort of 10 years what yeah. you're saying of clinical trials well there have been so many companies that had you know probably ideas that were viable that just ran out of money trying to get through that right right so it really process. stifles innovation um, because a company like Bluebell would have never been able to fund a multi-year clinical trial right yeah uh, you look at the kind of money that Big Pharma puts into these studies that prove new drugs. Like, not every company can be Pfizer, right? That makes sense. And, and so the 510K process is a boon, and it's allowed for a lot of companies in our space to essentially piggyback off of the designs of other folks. But it drives innovation. And it drives uh, it drives the the competition that you really need. Yeah, that makes sense. So Really cool. Yeah. So, anyway... Um, I don't remember what question I was answering. Uh, I guess it was Corey and Navio, but but essentially, yeah. So Navio was um, kind of built off this uh, this other drill, uh, and it was a kind of a I don't want to say skunk works. That's the wrong time. But I mean, it was very startupy, right? We, yeah. At the time of the design, the five ten k approval of that, um, you know, we I was had grown from to... maybe four people to. Well, we did our CE mark first, and we had manufacturing. So I don't know the number of people. So um, wait, you, you you did manufacturing before you put it through FDA. Well, so we did. Yes, we did, and that's because that's we had European approval well. first. So CE mark is the way to release medical devices in Europe. Oh, I didn't realize that you could release a medical device with just the CE mark. Yes, in Europe you can they, use it. Uh, you and do that because in at the time, too, right? and this is this has changed, but at the yeah. time, um, going in Europe was easier because. There was no sort of adjudication by like a body like the FDA. Yeah, that's you were audited according to your processes, and so if you showed that you had a uh, ISO or IEC compliant quality process, and you followed all of your own rules, and you got audited to that system, then when you put out medical devices, they were acceptable for use. So you that's can get your mark in your in your process, not necessarily for a product. Where at FDA, you had to get the product uh, approved. The CE mark said, nope, you, you're, you have the right kind of process. You can go ahead and get it to market. Yeah, which is more so we, of a quality and manufacturing thing, right? Right, right. So, yeah. and, and with quality is you know, software design quality and, and, and manufacturing quality and all these sorts of qualities. Um, but essentially, again, at the time, and things have changed in the meantime, yeah. um, the CE mark was a, a more uh, efficient path for us to get something in Makes use sense. clinically. And we did our first man surgery in Belgium. So oh, cool. I love Belgium. Bellemans in yes. Belgium, um, in Pedenburg. Uh, and so that was the first time that we saw our little device used on a real person. And it was like one of those <laughs> sort of like surreal moments where like you realize that it actually worked. Like the surgeon, <laughs> and it was, it was really funny because Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Bellemans, who is like one of the giants of his field, is like one of those guys that like discovers a new ligament. Nice. <laughs> like, he, like he wrote a paper actually a few years ago where they like discovered or named a new ligament. Like you think that by now we've found all the ligaments, <laughs> right? You would think, right? But, With like Netter's atlas being built in the eighties. Yeah, stuff. yeah. You know, you know, Da Vinci was sketching a lot of ligaments back. Yeah, then. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, in the fifteen hundreds. Yeah. You know? 
uh, like back when I was a kid, I think it was 206 bones in the body. I think it's still 206 bones in the body. They haven't found any more. But, but anyway, we're still finding new ligaments. But the, apparently there's a new ligament. Um, but anyway, like th th this doc is, is a, a legit surgeon, and he was the first to use our device. And it was just so weird because for us, this was like sort of a game-changing moment. And then, but, but when he was done, it's like, yep, all right. Come on. It was like another day for him. So <laughs> like, it, it, was, it was so weird that something that was so consequential and so, um, you know, such a big deal for us uh, was just such a kind just of another, fact another burr for him. operating room. Yeah. Uh, we were watching the surgery. There's like these tiny windows in the OR because they have these tiny operating rooms compared to what they have in the U.S. And we're like we're crammed and then looking through this window watching him do the surgery. And I think actually our our, our um, marketing lead was like scrubbed in on the surgery because he had <laughs> he had worked with this doc really closely and training him on the device and <laughs> everything just worked great. It's awesome. Uh, so yeah, that was. Did you try it on cadavers before you did it on a live patient? Oh yeah, we've done okay. a lot of cadavers and and you really have to. That makes sense. Like I remember. So you knew it was going to work. I mean, it wasn't. Well, I mean, that's one of those things, right? Like it, it, it had worked again and again and again. We went through a full round of validation experiments or, you know, we were fully confident in the design. Yeah. But, you know, the use in, in a live human and to have it be completely uneventful. That's a good you know, point. I, I mean, it's like, you know yet. what happens in a demo, right? Yeah. You know, Touché. you know, you do a demo like, well, and it worked when I turned it on yesterday, right? <laughs> so it's that sort of, that sort of. That impression. seems to be where, you know, the gremlins pop up is yeah. when people are watching or it matters. Yeah, exactly. And, and, yeah. you know, we've had plenty of stories. Like there was a great story with Blue Belt where like before one of our first surgeries in Europe, and I don't remember which one it was, maybe the first in the UK or something. Like one of the parts died in the cart, like the fuse blew or something like that. And you know, we had to, there's a part that we called the, the SIU that was like the kind of the system control unit for the, for the robot. Um, and we had to get one to the UK in order to do the service procedure to fix it, you know, the day before the surgery. And so it's oh, wow. one of those things like where you send, you not fly one, person? you fly two people nice. first class <laughs> because there's no seats left on the flight to get to the UK the day before. And they're both there sitting with the, an SIU in each of their seats, like <laughs> waiting to get over there, just in case one of them misses their flight or their connection. Or one of them's broken. Or, whatever, yeah. or one is broken. Or, or yeah. I mean, those are the sorts of things you do as a startup and those are the yeah, sorts of stories you tell. So I think it was, I think it was Jim Moody uh, and uh, Anthony Squilieri, who was one of our earliest mechanical engineers, still here in Pittsburgh. Um, Flying these things over to, <laughs> over to to Europe in order to make sure that we can swap it out. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty impressed that the TSA, TSA let those on the plane, man. Yeah, well, they look very yeah. innocuous. They're in there, sort of like you know, kind of like beige, yellow, like electronics <laughs> cases with a little bit of a brushed aluminum on the front. That's uh, fair. So very Radio Shack looking sort of devices. They look very yeah. innocuous. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing that that you do when you're just kind of doing surgeries and custom. And serve customers one person at a time. Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. sense. You don't want to take any chances. chances so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, we, I mean, th those were big events for us. And that's, that's, that's the thing the, I think that is, is the, when people talk about startup culture and kind of the, the bonds that they have with people they have in a startup and, and also how fun it is, is you rally around those sorts of events and those sorts of stories. And it's so oh, amazing sure. and so consequential. So we, we had a lot of those over. Yeah, I, uh, I love those war stories. stories. That's, That's like one of the things, things that uh, keeps me interested in this field is uh, just the, the things that go wrong and how people adapt to, to, to solve those problems and grow from them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Kind of keeps me interested. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, so how, how did how did you get, get here? Like, what, what what made you you know want to get into software engineering? And I guess how did, how did you uh, decide to come down this path? Like you know, sort of pre professional and, and how did that. Yeah, I mean, I got into software because I love video games. You and I were talking earlier today yeah. about the arcades. arcades. You know, I was the one that was walking around the arcade looking for that last quarter in one of the coin return slots that, that somebody too. forgot. Yeah. Because, yeah. I, as well. because I burned through my five uh, dollars worth of quarters. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I had an Atari and I had a Nintendo. Uh, and, you know, I, I wanted to write software after... I. I feel like Pitfall was like the defining moment, but I mean, that's just one of the number of games that I just love to play. But Pitfall sticks out in my mind as like one of the ones where it's just like, oh, it'd be so cool to do this. Because like when Pitfall came out, it was like so much different than a lot of the other games we were playing on the Atari. And I it, played Pitfall. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the time, it was like, it was amazing. And, and there's a fantastic, you know, I keep throwing out references here. There's a fantastic lecture that's on YouTube from the guy that made Pitfall and how hard they pushed that hardware to get the amount of content they did. Into that. That's interesting. That's a, it's a, if you, if you want to nerd out about like assembly code and bytes of RAM. I thought it was interesting, the, uh, the Donkey Kong, uh, what did they call it, the kill screen? I think. Yeah. So they didn't have enough memory right. to store the last level. Yeah. So we just died. Yeah. Just like didn't do anything else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's that sort of, it's that um, sort of design that's just like these guys were just squeezing every last bit, doing some genius things. Uh, it's like when you read about how they were doing the stuff in Doom, um, the first time they were Doom, or Wolfenstein, maybe it was Wolfenstein. Wolfenstein was a good Carmack, game. Carmack, this type of stuff that John Carmack was doing to like make this actually work, like the sort of deep stuff that they did and the map hacking that they were just doing. Picturing like bitwise operations. operations yeah, what really talking about this, like really, I read a little article about this like ingenious sort of like logarithmic approximation that they backed into in order to make it efficient to, you know, to render things. I, I wish I knew a little bit more about it, but like so there's like a 30 minute games. explanation of why this equation works. And this is the equation that Carmack used to draw these things. Yeah. And it goes into so many of these like really cool like math identities. And if you like, if you, if you like math, um, it's, it's super interesting to see that like how, how these guys that are this hacker is just like went so hard into like squeezing every last bit of performance. Out That's of pretty awesome. Yeah, it's really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, Pitfall and games like that um, made me always interested in video games. And, and so, you know, really like I, I figured out that computer science was what you went to school for in order to write video games. Yeah, it makes sense. Because that's where they teach you programming. And that was before computer science was really a thing around software development, right? That was kind of the era, like computer science, I think, in the years before, I, I went to school at CMU in 93. Oh, cool. Yeah, that was my freshman year. Um, like before that, computer science was a little bit more theoretical. This would have right? been as an undergrad in 93. Yeah, freshman yeah year, 93. Okay. In fact, when I was at CMU, the computer science degree was a math computer science degree. Like yeah, that it was makes a sense. blend. It wasn't quite a double major, but like it was very kind of math centric. Yeah. Because software is still relatively new. I think yeah. to study robotics as an undergrad, I don't know if it's changed where they have an actual major now, yeah. but it used to be at least, you had to double major in something else yeah. in robotics. Yeah, so when I went through the program, yeah. I was actually in, in the first class of master's students in robotics. Before okay. that, it was only a PhD program. Yeah. And so they piloted the robotics masters and I got in on that. That's awesome. When I was working at the university, and so that was a lucky break for me. Uh, and since now they have actually a robotics undergrad, which is super cool. How did you pivot from video games to robotics? Because that's, that's well, quite so a Well, I, I went, in, went into computer science uh, and I learned to program. And I'd always liked programming in, in high school, like basic programming stuff. I wasn't really, like our school, I, I, I went to not the most uh, not the most flush school from the standpoint of resources. Yeah. So they didn't have a lot of opportunities. There was no computer science AP class or anything like that. So. I learned starting at CMU, I learned C and, and, and C++ eventually after in work. Um, I think I took C++ at a community college when I was in high school. Yeah, no, was C++ was, was, I think, if, I don't know if it was invented when while I was working, but it, it became aware. Like C was the language. Like my first, when I took 15 to 11, it was the first year they didn't teach Pascal. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> as the intro program. That's one language I've never used. Yeah. Like that, that predates right. me by a lot. And so that's kind of the, the the turning point for Pascal to C was when I was an undergrad. Uh, and so um, that was pre-Java and all that sort of thing, right? Yeah, I, I learned on Java first, then right. C++. Right. And so, then I went to college and then I yeah. kind of expanded on it. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and, and so you know, I just go through the curriculum. No, right? I learned basic, then Java, then C++. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did basic and then straight to C++ because I didn't have, there wasn't anything else in the middle. Yeah. Um, C plus plus, I feel like it's a better second place to go than Java, though. I, I know Java's more popular now, but yeah, I mean, if you talk to guys like me that were raised on C, and you, you see how people learn Java, and then they don't know anything about memory management and stuff. Correct. Like that, yeah. Then you, oh, you can't tell how to use the free memory. Did I use a fucking pointer? Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but now you know with things like C sharp and stuff like that, like, it doesn't matter. You know, yeah. it's, it's all figured out, right? You know, even C++ so, is, is counting all of its references, and, and so it's fine. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, just to get back to what I was saying, the, the, the curriculum just takes you through and teaches you how to, to, to be a software engineer. Uh, and I was interested in robotics. I was also interested in getting a job that wasn't fast food. 
Um, so sense. I was very keen to get a programming job over the summer. So I think my sophomore year, uh, sophomore summer, was uh, the first time I got to work at the Robotics Institute as a programmer. Nice. I worked for the Manipulation Lab under Matt Mason, uh, and that was like super great. Like I went from you know flipping burgers over one summer to like by myself just writing the code that I needed to write to to help my grad student do his experiments. So That's Kevin awesome. Lynch, who's uh, is a professor uh, out in Northwestern now, was doing stuff with. Uh, he was in the manipulation lab, Matt Mason and Mike Erdman did the manipulation lab at CMU. And, and Kevin, I think I've actually been in that same lab uh, doing work. Uh, well, you were because Simon. that lab was in building D, which is oh, the okay. so not the dual assignments. So you know, I was been in that GPS coordinate, but uh, well, so I was in manipulation lab with an ABB arm in okay. A level of dual Simon. Um, okay. I think Matt Mason owned a chunk of that lab. Yeah. Maybe it was like the next They were iteration. down the hall from the medical robotics lab. But yeah, yeah. But when I was in that lab, that lab was in the basement of Building D, which is probably I don't know, the same D, elevation. That was before my time. Well, so, that, so Building D was torn down to build Mill Simon. Oh, okay, right? cool. So in that valley, um, it was just an older, more rundown looking building. <laughs> and then basically they tore that down and then built Mill Simon on top of that. That makes sense. Um, but uh, Yeah, this robotics thing might go somewhere. We'll throw some money on it. Yeah, no, they did pretty well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, so, yeah, I was working for them and Kevin was doing a couple things like basically around kind of pushing mechanics. So like he basically made this thing where, you know, he had figured out, you know, the non holonomic control of, of pushing an object around instead of grabbing it and moving. It. Which which Kevin was this again? Kevin Lynch. OK, sorry. So my he was a grad student that I was working for. Yeah. And so I wrote code that was basically commanding in the depth scare arm to kind of push a little square around. Oh, that's on, awesome. On the table. So you basically say, it starts here, and it's a camera, it sees you have the goal position here, it figures that out, it does the path playing, and the robot pushes it. So I wrote the code to translate um, Kevin's plans that he was generating in C into a text file and tell the robot to move around. So I mean, nice. I, I, this is the best job in the world, right? Like, yeah. just having fun, like, figuring out how to make this robot work. Yeah. And so, you know, I spent a lot of time doing that. I learned UE, UE programming because we had to, we ended up making a planner for that, uh, and then ended up putting it on a web page, like, like CGI graphics and Tickle TK and all kinds of stuff, like like stuff that's all just so totally ancient and deprecated by now. But like, <laughs> it was just so fun to to work on, um, and uh, he graduated. It, it basically was like, all right, well, I'm I'm graduating, so. Uh, and the project's over. I don't have a job, <laughs> uh, and so. But he referred me to a guy named David Simon, who was one of the Takeo Kanade's grad students. Oh, cool! Uh, he was working on um, basically uh, tracking a pelvis. Uh, Takeo is really into working. vision systems, right? Uh, yeah, so Takeo's the vision system. Yeah. So David was was working on really fast ICP algorithms, accelerated ICP algorithms, in order to do ICP? kind of. Uh, iterative closest point. Got so it. whenever okay. you collect the region of points on the surface and you yeah. want to match it to some data model, yeah, that it's it's kind of a standard algorithm now in 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 that world. But it was kind of slow because it was sort of like a order n squared sort of operation. That so makes sense. He, he did a lot of um, accelerations and did some simulated annealing uh, in order to kind of jump out of local minimum so that you can get fast and accurate registration. And his use case was pelvises. So basically, if I collect points on the surface of a pelvis and I have a CT scan and I want to know how that set of points fits to the CT scan, how do we do that fast and accurate? So nice. that's the lab I joined. That's awesome. Day one, we go in, we're in some hot conference room in, uh, in the, uh, gosh, what's, what hall is that? Smith Hall? Uh, is it Smith Hall? We? No, no, no. It's the one that's across the street from Mill Simon where they built like this big cafe on the back side of it now. Um, I think it's Smith Hall. Um, I'm thinking of the Heinz College, but maybe I'm... Behind, behind, uh, oh man, I can't believe I'm totally yeah. blanking on it. It doesn't matter. Fair I enough. I joined this lab where this ancient, <laughs> this conference room, no air conditioning, it's, it's hot as hell. It's oh, the brutal. It's summer, and they say, okay, you're going to work for Branco. So, Branco is, um, uh, a, a large, quiet man. <laughs> uh, with an Eastern European accent, and uh, you know, I was assigned to him, and my job was to write. What is his role at the university at this point? So he was a I, I can't remember if he was an adjunct or assistant professor. Okay. Um, 
he was working actually for the Shady Side Hospital Lab. Yeah, was, he was an appointed at CMU, but it was Shady Side Hospital Lab, uh, and Dr. DeJoya's research group there. Uh, and he was doing like finite element modeling of, of femurs and, and um, doing this sort of range of motion planning for hip implants and, and doing a couple of other projects. And so I took over the project that his last grad student had left off with to do <laughs> range of motion simulation of hip implants. Yeah. So the idea is if you put your hip implants, hip implants in this way, how do they bang into each other as you move your leg? Okay, how do you optimize sense. those positions of those implants? Yeah. So, um, I've been doing that work for him for 25 years or something like that, essentially. Like we, you know, the work that we did there expanded into a 3D planner. And, and so, you know, to your point, like building a 3D planner that surgeons work with is basically building a video game for surgeons. Okay. Right. Yeah, I can see that. And so like, not that I was like, I was any sort of interested in medical robotics, but the kind of graphical UI work that I was doing was immediately engaging enough. Right, this is like the dot com era, right? Like people yeah. were going off and and going and in, 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 uh, the beginnings of the web, you know, writing is just getting paid a crap load of money yep. for doing like you know credit card you know, uh, databases and Why stuff like that. Why would you like put that, that on the internet? <laughs> it's like all this but, but it, like I was so happy to like make this user interface and take it to the doctor and, yeah. and be like, oh yeah, this is cool, but can you make it do this? Like, yeah, sure I can, you know? And you run, you go and you spend the day doing this and you go back and say, how about this? Like, okay, that's great. Like that immediate- That's awesome. That feedback was just fantastic. And, and I love that work. Uh, and so I did that for a while. And, and ultimately as the intern, uh, my second year, I was looking after the other interns. And so I became eventually an employee at CMU as a research programmer. And so I was kind of the intern wrangler in the summers and, and I was programming the whole time. When the startup company spun off, uh, I was still working for the university, but I was working on the same planner that the commercial team was trying to commercialize. That's interesting. And, and so they were building the product and we were helping them kind of build out the feature set. Uh, and, uh, so it sounds like you almost weren't really a research programmer, like you were, you were building a commercial program. Well, I mean, at the same time we were writing papers and doing okay. research, right? So I mean, I. So there was just some cross pollination. There's a lot of cross pollination, for, right? Because there like, always is. Yeah, I've seen every startup company plenty of companies in university in Pittsburgh has gone into the FRC and machine the part. Yeah. And so yeah, that's yeah. That's I mean, th this was all like cooperative grant funded research, right? So CMU is subcontractor, the labs a subcontractor. Uh, and, and so you're all working on this goal. They're collaborative efforts between CMU and the research lab and the company to prove these concepts and to develop these products. That's kind of the SVIR program. Yeah. Okay. And Wouldn't that so, be like STTR? Or STTR. So the difference between SBIR and STTR is STTR is typically more owned by the university. Okay. And SBIR is owned by the business. Okay. So it's really about a percentage of effort and who gets what. That makes sense. Um, and so I was writing SBIRs eventually because whenever, by the time I was writing them, I was part of the company because we were trying to find the company. Um, and we were always collaborations with the universities and or the research labs because that's where uh, the, the science was being done and we were building the products that were being evaluated. Awesome. Um, so I will always vote Democrat because I have to <laughs> pay it backward, right? Because that is the sort of thing that, like my career is funded on these sorts of government economic development projects yeah and and it worked for us and in fact you know blue belt was probably saved by uh some of those economic development things that were done during the recession right so that's I awesome can't remember the name of the program but uh, we got grant funding because there was you know a flush of, of government research that was was funded through that and so um, yeah but I, I, I can never i can never poo poo that level of, of, of uh, you know, government involvement and in spending, because yeah. you know, that's kind of what's fed my family for. Well, it also for sounds years. like it's led to some really useful work that's advanced. You know, I mean, ultimately, profession. yes, we're a success story, right? Yeah. So we were, I don't remember, we, we had some milestone, maybe the first MedTech exit that, that CMU had had, um, and certainly a, a really, really successful one. Um, you know, we're one of the first robotic orthopedic systems that are out there changing the way that people do knee replacement. I, you know, the, the things I was saying before, you know, are enabled, these these different changes in thinking about the way implants should be put in and the sort of control you can have over them are only because of robotics. There was a wave of what was called navigation where 
you use the same sort of sensors to kind of guide where the implants are positioned. But the mode of execution wasn't, wasn't quite there. And frankly, they yeah. were aiming for the wrong targets because they hadn't seen the experience and didn't have the, the sort of um, ways to, to detect it. And frankly, there was 20 years of technology and comfort with technology that came along with it. Uh, and so we're kind of on a second wave of adoption of technology kind of spurned by robotics. Yeah. But it's all with the same idea is that now with the data that you have and with the sensors that you have, you can really measure what you're doing and control the, the operation. Pretty cool. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, it's for me, it's always been something new and something is interesting and something different. Like whether it was kind of doing a cadaver lab for the first time, right, with the software that you wrote or... When was doing, that? Like when, when was the first time you actually got to try it on a cadaver? So it, it's really funny things get put in perspective. So it's Smith and Nephew, we do cadaver labs all the time. I'm doing a cadaver lab tomorrow. Nice. Right. We have our own lab where we sponsor this and we do sales training and we do R&D development. And there's a lab every week, right? You know, bodies come in and off of our loading dock because this is, that's just the work that we have to do. Right? Yeah. Um, where do you get the bodies? Uh, there's a specimen lab that we work with that, that, that finds the, 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 the specimens that we need to work with. And if, if we have to have special sort of disease things, they work with us on doing this. If we need specifically arthritic patients or large oh, patients cool. or whatever, you can customize in that way. Because like really there's no analog. Like we do a lot of f plastic bones. We do pig bones when it's necessary. But like yeah. when you're doing surgical training, when you're doing experiments, you have to see how these things work with the robot. You, have, human, to, yeah. you have to go to, to cadaver specimens. That makes sense. And it's expensive. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure to build around it. Yeah. But, um, it's critical. Um, makes but, well, my, my dad's an orthopedic surgeon, mm -hmm. and he's told me there's still differences with a cadaver that you don't get with a live person. Yeah, so, like, it's they're true. stiffer. The quality um, of the bone, the stiffness of the ligaments. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's still not the quite. The blood's not really there, so you don't have that occluding your vision with like an arthroscope or yeah, something. Yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. very true. Um, but it's as close as we can get yeah, as engineers, for sure. Um, the, uh, the first cadaver lab though, that we ever did, um, they, it was at the university, and, and Fritz, who was one of our master students at the time, was driving the body around in the, in the back of his uh, <laughs> back of his Volvo. <laughs> He's because we had to, because we did the work. I don't remember where we did the lab work, but it wasn't the same place where we scanned the, the specimen. So he was driving it back and forth between some UPMC site where we had access to the CT scanner after hours to do the to do the scan. They 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 did the lab. Um, then, and this is an amazing thing I'll never forget, <laughs> because we were doing the um, the registration experiment. So the, the like, can I collect the points and match this to the CT registration scanner? being akin to painting? Registration is a process of figuring out how that painting has to fit to the three D data. Interesting. So, so that's so there's I mean registration is the that's process like the of painting and figuring out the transform. Right. Okay. You collect the points, and those points have to fit uniquely to the anatomy as determined by the preoperative scan. Okay. So that match, which says, I know how to go from- But I thought from... you said you don't need to do a preoperative scan with, or am I? Well, so okay. with the Navio system, yeah. which is which is an image-free system, we don't do that. We do that mapping in the operating room and we, we do modeling a little bit different. But the HIPNAV days was all about preoperative CT scans okay. and taking models. So this early work that we did, the first okay. cadaver so, that we you, did was in the lab, nice was the HIPNAV project. And we were trying to prove that the segmentation process, which is how you like pull the 3D shape of the pelvis out of the CT scan, um, was accurate. So we had our pipeline of software that was doing the segmentation. A lot of it was manual work. And we had this 3D mesh at the end of it. And we needed to show that this 3D mesh actually matched the, the pelvis. Okay. So what they do is they take this cadaver and they drive it to the facility where they feed the specimen to the beetles that eat away all the soft oh, tissue cool. off of the cadavers, which is apparently how they clean dinosaur bones. They have these beetles that eat dead tissue off I have off a friend who's doing that in his basement right now with some kind of... Right. It's like a thing now you can order yeah. off the internet, right? Like, <laughs> I'm going to buy my flesh-eating beetles. But this was something that was completely unheard of at the but time. But they only go after necrotic flesh. So right. it's like safe it, to have them around. Yeah, yeah. You keep yeah. those pets and put them in a tank and show yeah. your friends. 
Um, but, but if you ever have a spare dead skull, you can throw it in there and it cleans it off in a jiffy. But we had this some resource of where we could take this pelvis so that we could go clean it off and then run it. Verify the... Yeah, okay. and you run into the South Hills where there's a CMM shop, right? Because no labs have But you have to do CMMs. that to the... You did this in a machine shop? We did it at somebody's machine shop. This was not any, <laughs> so CMU didn't have a CMM machine. For people listening, time. like a CMM is a coordination measurement machine. Yeah, it and they exist in program. machine top shops to, to verify that parts have been made correctly. So you're taking a skeleton into a machine yeah. shop. <laughs> yeah, basically, well, it's been clean, so it's, it's you know yeah. the Beatles did their job, and you take yeah. it in, and then some hence it's a skeleton some now. Operator slash robot has got to go and with a ruby tip probe and touch all the points on the surface. I'm sure Hexagon didn't have that in mind when they sold that shop that machine. Yeah, and so anyway, that's how we showed that our 3D model was accurate, and so you know the the chain of of, of surgical accuracy. That's amazing. From there. Uh, I mean, and that's the thing. Like, well, those is, things are accurate to like microns. So, I mean, that's right. that's a great way to do it. Right. That's the ground truth. How do you know yeah. that something was made or measured to spec? If your model was correct, that's how you do it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's how we did it. So our first cadaver lab involved that. Um, and I would say maybe our second cadaver lab was because at the time in the research world at, at CMU, uh, it, it, there was like cadavers were like precious like you never had access to these things because these are yeah. only things that were in some sort of a you know you know surgical and like an educational environment or the company or whatever so we planned so many experiments we had like a dozen different so experiments. whenever you get a hold of a cadaver you ran it through every single right. experiment you could yeah, just we, to get we had a partnership with so dr freddie Fu. um the hand surgeon that he passed recently yeah right? he passed recently but yeah. world renowned acl surgeon he has a, a a flurry of grad students at Pitt and we worked with them uh, and they had their own experiments on doing ACL reconstruction and force measurements after ACL reconstruction. So, I mean, we happened upon this lead, this, this cadaver specimen, um, we called Jonesy. I don't know why his name was Jonesy. But I'll never <laughs> forget that name. And literally Jonesy um, had so many experiments, everything from ultrasound imaging and registration to our little robot, the first time we ever used our our, our, our smart robot on a, a cadaver specimen, to ACL reconstruction, like it just uh, and this was all in one day. And so it's just all the mileage you get out of Jonesy. The planning, like, we, like we planned yeah. this cadaver trial for yeah. weeks. Um, how did you know you were gonna get? How do you even get on the list to get a cadaver at that point? Well, that, so that was kind of yeah. where the Freddie Food Connection came in because those guys had access. So they had done their thing and they were sort of finished with the specimen. Well, no. So they were going to do their thing, but we all agreed that we would collaborate on the research because we had sort of active ACL sort of experiments to go on to say that. So we again we had an active STTR to do ultrasound registration to knee models and MRI scans for doing ACL reconstruction, right? Okay. So we were gonna do that on the leg and then the grad students were gonna do all of their force device measurements after we did the ACL reconstruction. Like oh, there was this whole, I mean, it was the, like everything from preoperative CT and MRI scans. That could so be like how do we line. satisfy all these stakeholders yeah, with this it very was, limited it was, resource? It was amazing. And, yeah. and Jim Moody, God rest his soul, spent so much time um, just planning and, and owning the, the control and evaluation of this experiment. And so I'm just by the, this thing sitting in the back of a Volvo. <laughs> well, this wasn't the Volvo, but it might as well have been because he, he had quite a ride at, at, at the end of this journey. Uh, but it, the, I mean, it was it just so amazing. Like the I'm gonna donate work. my body to science. Even, like I was going to, but now I really want to, just so I can be part of a story. Oh like yeah, that. I, that's another thing. Like yeah. I, I can never not donate my body to science because I have. <laughs> leverage the donations of so many people for the work that we do and, and the whole point of my story is that like it was so precious back then to have that and so much work went around it and now to think like that we just do this every week yeah. like this is just like oh thursday we're doing a lab okay right yeah. we're just ready like the equipment is ready everybody knows how to do this we have a lab technician scans come in we like this is just an operational thing that smith and nephew can do because they're a multi-billion dollar global so is it just a money company. thing like if you have a certain amount of cash you can command these well cadavers. yeah i mean the, the thing is like whenever smith and nephew needs to train customers on their products right you need to train them on an adequate uh training models and if and you just can't do it, you can't do an ACL reconstruction on plastic bones, right? Yeah, makes sense. And so for training and for education and for R&D in our case, 
um, you have to have this pipeline of set up so yeah. that whenever you have a team of 10 surgeons that are going to get trained, you can, you can cover that sort of a, an education process. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so, you know, it's such a gift for us as a resource organization uh, to be able to have this sort of thing where before it was just unheard of. Um, like, you know, just going after hours and, and so many like pig legs and things that we would use yeah. because it was so much easier to go to the butcher makes sense. to organize that. But like a pig leg is like this big and like it's super tight. And to, like I've done my share of knee surgeries. In fact, I doubted that we would ever, ever make a product after trying to cut in pig knee. Because <laughs> I like looked at our, uh, and this is bad management, right? So I'm managing a couple of software engineers. And we do this trial and we're running through the software and we just can't get it to work. It's just so frustrating. The burr isn't sticking out the right direction. And then like the knee is so tight and we're like, and it's a pig knee. And a pig knee is like, you know, it's like a ham. It's a ham. It's literally a ham. And it is just <laughs> like a mass of flesh and, and the knee, knee barely moves because knee or pig knees don't move like our knees. They move oh, a little I see. bit. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And the sense. ligaments in the, the soft tissue and the it's geometry. Anatomically, it's not even meant to have the same super, range of motion. It's super tight, right? Yeah. But it's the closest thing you could buy from Saxonburg, right? Yeah. Uh, for like 20 bucks or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, we get if the... that. We get I'm sure the, it was cheaper. It wasn't much cheaper. Uh, <laughs> but, but also, it's, it's really funny because, like, when you got to order a pig leg, like, what they sell at the butcher shop is not the pig leg you need, right? Interesting. And so one of the things, like, I had to learn, I was like, oh, we want the H-bone. Because we wanted the we wanted the full hip. Yeah. Right? So we wanted the full femur because typically a ham is just this chunk. Right? Oh, okay. Right? It's just a part of it. Ideally, but we the wanted leg the too, we wanted the, the it all the way up to the femoral head. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Which is apparently called the H bone, which I can only assume stands for hip bone. Interesting. But I had I mean Maybe and trying to translate, you know, orthopedic research robotics talk to, to butcher jargon. The butcher jargon. Like I want it, I, I I need the leg. I need all the skin on the leg. Like it needs to have the knee Intact. inside of it. Yeah. Right. I need about this far down, and then as far up as you can go. Oh, oh, you want it with the H bone? Like yeah. All right. Like, yeah, I can tell you that, but you can't eat it. Can't eat it. Why not? Because it wasn't processed the right way for food. Like there's some oh, rule so like, about it. You gotta that, remove like, certain things for it to be considered food. I don't know. I that's one of those unknown things. But that's that weird. was the thing. It's like yeah, we, it's, this isn't for food. This is just for research because. They didn't process it the same way. That sounds like less work for them, if anything. Yeah, I guess. It is less work for them, but I mean, I guess if the skin is intact, right, then you know, yeah. they didn't clean it off like a ham. You don't clean oh, it okay. I can, like, I'm see guessing, that. right? I have no idea. That might be it. Like, there could be contaminants on the exterior of the skin, and therefore... Yeah, I think that yeah. they just... To leave it more intact, there's less processing, and so they don't do everything they need to do yeah. to kind of rubber stamp it. Plus, that would be gross. Because <laughs> it resembles yeah. the body part, then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> anyway... Uh, uh, like, like yeah, we're, we're trying to cut this pig leg, leg and I just I, I just turned to the to my software engineer and I said I don't know if we're ever gonna get this to work. <laughs> like and that was the second time that I doubted that we were ever gonna get this crazy smart drill that could respond to your motion to get to work. I mean, whenever Gabe gave his PhD, um, whatever the proposal, right? When he goes, this is what my PhD project's gonna be. I just remember thinking like that's never gonna. It, is, it, it makes, makes sense, right? Like, like I mean, I've watched YouTube videos of knee replacements, and if you can't get that range of motion, you know, it's like I can I can imagine that would be very very challenging to perform that surgery. Well, for me, it was just like I don't see how you're ever going to make a drill retract fast enough in order for the surgeon to not constantly overcome it. Like oh, interesting. Like for me, I just I just didn't think that the would be like an actuation the, power problem. Well, it's a processing problem because oh, okay. you got to yeah, sense sense. where is everything. You got to do all the and calculations figure and figure all the, out how far uh, I need okay. to collect. Yeah. Do all the geometry, right? Uh, and you've got to send the command to the robot, and the robot's got to be fast enough to push this burr, which is spinning in some amount, some distance, in that microsecond before you moved it, right? So this yeah. is a drill, right? Drills move when you. If you ever tried to like. Take a spinning drill and just plunge it into something. It kicks off to the side, right? Yep. So the, the moment, moment, the moment it contacts. Yeah. Like so, the, you know, the force of gravity forces throw it all over the place, right? Yep. Uh, and yeah, we're not talking about any sort of mass where you're going to kind of get that sort of stability. Like this is just, it's like, if you've ever tried to cut with a Dremel tool, it jumps yeah. when you try to cut, right? So this is a yeah. Dremel tool that somehow has to be smart enough to kind of jujitsu out of the way whenever you try to go into the wrong spot. 
Um, yeah. And so I, I, just, I never thought it was going to work. But you know, I'm happy to try. It's interesting work, and ultimately became my job because. Yeah, you didn't pay. Well, I mean, at the time, I was I was working on the hip stuff, and Gabe was just a grad student working on this crazy idea. And eventually, that became my job to make this crazy idea work because that was what the company was now. Yeah. Uh, and so we tried, and and we kept working on it, and um, you know, we went through all different types of modeling, and we we switched from knees to spines, and spines to craniums, and craniums to mastoids, and back again to knees, and, and that's it's interesting. That you yeah, did spines, spines and cranium. I did that. Yeah, no idea. yeah. We did spine and cranial because the project and the money ran out for knees because we stopped working <laughs> with the implant companies. But there are some surgeons in town that like thought our stuff was cool, and they got Medtronic to throw some money at a spine application. That's interesting. So we took our CT scans of the knees because we were doing CTs at the time. But that's the easiest way to get a shape, right? We weren't yeah. doing all the image-free stuff that we do now. That was a later development. But the early development was based on images. And so we took our CT scan of the knee and we replaced it with a CT scan of the spine. And, you know, the geometry is all different, right? So you've got to adapt to that. But the, and the shape of the drill has to be different. And so we took that grant funding to make those changes and, and, and we ran with it and did some more trials and proved some concepts and wrote some more grants and 100 grand here, 200 grand there, 50,000 here at a time. We kept the company alive and we were able to, to grow stuff. And, and you know what? I want to give a shout out to Craig. I know he's been on your program. Um, hey, hey, Craig. Hey, <laughs> Craig. Um, <laughs> Craig ran that company and I never, ever felt the pain of a startup. Right between him and Branco, I don't know what I, near the end. Eventually, we had to have the conversation that we're running out of money, and, and I don't know if Craig pulled out of your program or not. I think but, he did, <laughs> and, but it's an interesting story, and we were saved kind of at the last minute. But um, like, it never felt it never felt worrisome. It, like I had a job every day. I came. You just to work. jump on those grenades for you, and, and I mean, he was able to keep everything going, and yeah. and whatever he did, and I don't know if if I know everything that he did. Um, but I kind of want to invite him on again now hearing these stories. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Craig, Craig, uh, will tell that story. He's told this story a lot. Uh, and his story is great because he, even when he came and gave presentations to Smith and nephew telling the story and there was even details that I didn't know about, about just specifically when he lays out the numbers about, about what he first proposed would cost to do this thing. And what we would sell for, and then ultimately what it actually costs us to do, and then what we sold for. It's it's, it's a pretty remarkable set of numbers. Um, but we never felt like there was any any problem until we had to have the car, hard conversation. Like, all right, things are getting tough. What are we going to do, right? And even that was not a that was a, a collaborative work together sort of conversation. Yeah. Not a you know polish up your resume. Things are going on the tour. Yeah. Right? Someone's got to go. Right. Like who are we firing? It was not that at all. Yeah. Um, and so to their credit, uh, both him and Branco, it was so even keel. We just kept working and kept trying to do what we can. And, and, and the, the people were wonderful. And, and every, every cliche you know about team and getting the right people on the bus and all that sort of thing is exactly true. That's what we have with people. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, you know, after we ran out of money and then we're saved, um, we were able to kind of get a couple of bumps and that's when we be kind of was this being saved by the cranial uh stuff no or? no it was after the cranial after all that so um i'll let craig tell that story in part two of the craig work of its interview um, craig come back but but essentially we were kind of saved <laughs> if you're by, listening email me call me <laughs> we were saved in part by the tarp funding we were saved because that grant kind of came through uh we were saved by some local angel investment investment um, and I, again, I won't say the name because I think the team wants to kind of keep that sort of thing under wraps. Yeah, sure. but it was tremendously successful, successful. And eventually the final leg was the capital investment we got from a, a health point capital out of New York. Oh, cool. And that group bunch of money was actually an acquisition. So blue belt was bought the first time then by health point, by health point where they took it over, but left us intact and said, all right, now that, now that we're running things, you guys got to go and make a product. Cause up until that point we were building technology for someone to license. So we you were went just to doing all the grants companies, over and over and over again, basically. Doing grants and going to, so we go to Zimmer, we go to Stryker, we go to Depew and say, yeah. we have this cool robotics technology, um, why don't you incorporate it into your navigation product? Or why don't you build on top of this? Or why don't you buy us and, yeah. and, or whatever? But all we could ever get was kind of sponsored research. Yeah. Six months to a year at a time, some, you know, kind of, to Craig's credit, 
kind of like, you know, worry free money, like free money essentially, no obligations, yeah, no, no ownership. How did keep us people moving. pay for that if there was no obligation? Because Craig's really good at negotiating these sorts of things. <laughs> That's awesome. I, I mean, the only obligations we had were to like our angel and capital investors and, and to some of the local um, economic development work. Who, who was sponsoring the research? Cells, et cetera. They, we, we had major orthopedics and medical device companies. Okay. So, but they got it. Did they get access to the IP in exchange no. for? Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Like I said, it's, it's uh, Craig was really good at getting I'll that work done. That. I'm really curious now. Hmm? So I'll have to ask him about that. I'm really curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately they, at the end of the day, um, I'm not quite sure why they ultimately agree to those sorts of things. And me being on the other side of that as now at a big company is very mindful of like, well, what are we getting out of this research? But yeah. Our obligations were very minimal. We had to demonstrate concepts for surgeons. And so it was more about giving them access to future, like what the view of the future would be in front of their doctors. Cause they were never going to develop that themselves. Okay. So they're, I don't, there may have been some rights of first refusal that were fairly low lift at that, that point. That makes sense. But again, there was no, there was no sort of real obligation. We were able to re remain very independent through all of that. Cool. Um, and, and so that was, you know, with, with Craig at the helm running all that sort of thing. And by the time capital, the, the health point capital came in, it was a different mode of operation. So they brought in a new CEO uh, and uh, he took over and it was about selling, right? So he built the sales and operational organization that was actually out of Minneapolis. Um, but uh, we kept growing and building the R&D effort. That's when we applied for the FDA approval. We got our quality system in place. We built a surgical application. So the image free stuff was built all on top of that core robot IP. Cause all we really had yeah. was this toolkit that we wanted to sell to other people. We essentially became our own customers and built our own system around that IP. Well, that makes sense if you're, if you're painting how that would be it will be plugged into something that worked with the CT scan originally, if I'm understanding correctly. Well, I mean, ultimately, the input, all we need is a 3D model. Yeah. Right. So the CT scan, it comes with a 3D model. Yeah. Um, when you're painting in the in surgery, you're building a 3D model. Yeah. But at well, the end of the day... certain parts that have to be inferred, because you just see, like, the head of the bone, and so you have to figure there's, like, right. a shaft or some anatomy here. Right. Well, that's where that's where all of our years in computer assisted surgery came in, right? Because we had done a lot of image free work in the lab. So the concepts around well, how do you find the hip center? You know, what are the things that are appropriate for modeling? What are the things that you really care about versus details of the joint that you don't care about Makes for knee sense. surgery? We had been developing and or building that knowledge. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the time. middle of the femur looks like. Exactly. With that exactly. Knee surgery. Nothing in the middle of the femur matters. Your articulating yeah. surface matters. Your kinematic center of your hip rotation matters yeah. because you're building this kind of weight bearing axis. Yeah. And so knowing the landmarks that matter, both technically as well as kind of from the history of the literature and stuff, you know, that was the work that we had been doing over the years, both in hip and knee. And so we were very aware of what we needed to put into a clinical application because frankly, the, the field had come and kind of gone at that point. So we could leverage, you know, what a non-image based system needed to look like because there are other people that had built ones yeah. but they didn't have a robot attached to it pretty cool and frankly you know because of the success of the mako system and their ability to kind of sell robotics again we were able to leverage that um and kind of ride their coattails and and because they made the market for robotic knee surgery and we were also a robot but we were an alternative to this big arm robot yeah uh and, and it was this small little handheld robot uh, and ultimately, that's kind of what allowed us to compete in that way and, and then eventually get bought by Smith and Nephew. And that's what got you through FDA as well with the 510K process? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we were able to show that our robot was safe. Uh, the planning principles were very similar to everything else that had been out there already. So the image-free thing wasn't the new thing. Um, even though major competition in Mako was doing a CT scan, there was a long precedent of image-free uh, navigation techniques that we leveraged. So you can show multiple technologies that have the different pieces that you're trying to tie together. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't remember how much we maybe pointed to some of the image-free things that we did as part of the predicate analysis. Yeah. Um, but it was enough. There was enough explanation about kind of what the similarities and differences were to the predicate devices. Um, 
that allowed us to, to, to be out there. But again, you know, I don't know how much of that, of that single point of, of comparison matters if you have a reviewer that is aware of the field. Like so some of the questions we got on the FDA review, we're asking kind of pointed questions about our techniques that were based on knowledge of other systems that were not our predicate. Yeah. It's like, well, why didn't you do like this system does or this paper says? And so we can explain why we did it and eventually that dialogue can become satisfactory. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's a, it, it's it's really interesting, and you know, as we develop more and more, the problems are now different, right? So the, the problems of uh, supporting a new system in a global sense, right? Interesting. It's different than getting that first one to work. It's Is different that more than getting, regulatory than than engineering? At oh, this I point? mean, it's so. Is it still engineering in some way? But. I mean, it's just there's just so much more to worry about, right? You've got to worry about training people on a global scale. You've got to worry about internationalization. You've got to worry about having a, a service organization that can spread um, across the full globe, right? So yeah. uh, the part breaks in India and a part breaks in in uh, Kuwait, right? Yeah. Like, you can't fly engineers with boxes in their laps everywhere, right? You've yeah. got to figure out how to do that, right? And so... Um, Navio was a 500 pound cart that we put in a giant crate, right? Yeah. Corey is something that chips in a pelican case. That That's pretty awesome. Plane, right? Yeah. So those are the sorts of things that we learned and the, the things that we've done over time to kind of support the more global business. Yeah. And, and how we've been able to kind of keep that growing. So I would think if Corey is that small, you could just ship a whole new one if something goes wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So right. rather than having to go in and service parts, we can send them a new console. I mean, our console is this big, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's like sending somebody a new stereo. Yeah, uh, and, and then they send the old one, one back, in. right? And then we repair that, so there's a oh, it's a lot easier to, to perform that sort of service, as opposed to with with Corey or sorry with Navio, Navio. you got to go in there and you got to get under the hood and replace parts. Now, granted, you know, you know, we leverage a lot of modularity, but it's still a pain. Yeah, you can't so. ship this thing on a pallet back to Minneapolis to get it fixed every time something goes wrong. Yeah, you could, but it would get right ridiculous. Right, very but fast. you can overnight a uh, Corey unit FedEx. Yeah, you know for you know. 20 bucks so wow or whatever the, the overnight yeah. is like you know even if it's like 200 bucks you know yeah cares? yeah, yeah. So. so it's but solving those problems and having that infrastructure and having the people in place to be able to build all that is is the new challenge of being in a group like with a nephew as opposed to um you know, something like blue belt which is like keeping the lights on and selling them one at a time yeah that makes a lot of sense right and I, I want to ask about the miniaturization, but I feel like that probably gets into IP that you can't talk about. So, I mean, yeah. not really. All right, fair enough. Um, how do you make something that was like what? Why did it need to be five hundred pounds? And how do you? Well, I mean, so to cut out to the original small. Navio design. Um, this isn't disparaging the engineers that worked on it because it was the the first pass. It was built like a Soviet tank. It was, it was like a, it was a, it was a steel sheet metal box, um, and it had a computer and all the electronics inside. It had a backup battery inside. Um, it had the third-party drill console on top, touchscreen monitor on a boom arm. Yep. And then you know like the camera stand would dock into it. The camera stand was you know for some reason in the beginning made of steel. We eventually migrated to, to aluminum, which saved us about hundred pounds. Uh, but still, this is, it, these things had to be stable enough to not tip over when you have a seven, seven foot boom on it, right? Yeah. So these things have to be sort of heavy. But the idea was always that we were going to build ten, get the FDA approval, release them, and then work on the next iteration. Yeah, makes sense. The design is the same today. Like we still have the avios in the field. We did not iterate on that. That original design, other than like end of life issues and, and like problems mechanically that we had to fix. Yeah. There was no redesign. That's the kind of, that's the sort of like naivete of a startup company. <laughs> We're going to build the 10. These are the ones that we use for the validation testing. And like when we get this validated and we get some traction in the market, then we're going to come back and redo the design. It. Right. Yeah. Nope. Six years later, same design. 15 years later, same design. Right? Oh, wow. Okay. Like that design was probably finalized in like 2011. You know, the Navios look pretty much the same today, except like the touchscreen monitor has gone through three generations. Yeah, that sense. company that doesn't make the same model anymore. And that but tech is drastically different than it yeah. was. The first computer that was inside was a Dell. 
and the next one was a, the next version of the Dell, and the next one was the next version of the Dell. Every year there was a new you know, <laughs> business computer that was inside because we were based on desktop um, technology. Um, and then we stopped using Dells because we got sick of doing that, right? That makes sense. So you use a long-term service PC that you buy from a distributor. Um, but, you know, again, it's still about this big, and it still has a you know, Intel-based motherboard on it, and it's still running the software uh, the way we run the software. So, it, you know, that Soviet tank, like, you know, basically got us to where we are. It, yeah. It, it's fine. And people are still using it because uh, there are still patients. Uh, surgeons that have Navio, they haven't upgraded yet, um, for whatever reason. Um, so it's still out there, but yeah. But the uh, the difference between managing that system and managing something like Corey, where you can kind of ship it in the box anywhere you want, I mean, it's game changing. So yeah, that's that's incredible. Awesome. Any well, anything else that you feel like is is pertinent? I feel like we're probably at like a good natural stopping point, but I could keep going too. Um, I mean, no, I. I it's it's funny when you look back it's really like the the work and stuff is neat and you can talk about technology and things but you know ultimately it's really about the people right yeah and, and so it sounds like you really had a dream team here yeah i mean we we just have such great folks and and we still you know six years into the acquisition we were purchased in 2016 we still talk about kind of blue belt culture and we're still nostalgic of that and um and you know it was a really special group yeah. Uh, and, you know, I talk about Craig and Brecko this way because they, these guys are like my brothers and my uncles and my mentors and all these sorts yeah. of things all rolled into one. You know, we, we fought these battles and we still stay in great touch. I mean, I still work with Brecko every day um, back since, you know, 1996 or something like that. Wow. Um, but, you know, it's still great to work together, right? And, and so I think that that's the thing that's, you know, keeps it interesting in Smith & Nephew is that you have this sort of pocket of people and you can kind of build that and it changes a little bit as you go, but it's still kind of rallying around this idea of, of working together to kind of solve these goals and, and, and being good people to each other uh, and supporting each other. And so um, it's, 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 it's super, I'm super lucky to have been latched onto that group of a bunch of stellar individuals. And, and even though it's kind of morphed over the years, um, it's still this, the sort of thing that keeps you around is the, is the people. That's awesome. Are there, are there still a lot of folks from the original Blue Belt team around, or is it? Is it yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I don't, I don't know. You know, every once in a while, you lose somebody that was around the Blue Belt and they go to a different opportunity. You know, um, but there's still a good chunk around, um, and uh, um, you know, we've we've actually had one or two people come back <laughs> because of a, a circumstance. That's awesome. Um, but it, but it's 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 super cool and, and a lot of the folks are still in Pittsburgh and you know, we, we play get-togethers and we stay in touch. Yeah, uh, I think that's huge for a team is, yeah. is when people actually want to hang out with each other outside of work. Yeah, like I, I always whenever I'm getting to know a, know a, a company culture, one of the first things I always ask is you know, do you want to get a beer with your coworkers? Like, yeah. do, do you get a beer with your coworkers outside of work? Because I feel like if the answer is no, then you know, why not? Like, yeah. what what do you? Yeah, no, I can't I, wait to bolt. The, the, <laughs> you know, like, the people I want to get a beer with and the people I enjoy having a beer with are always my coworkers. Uh, and one of the things we do when we drink beer is we talk about work. It is yeah, one of those of things, like, <laughs> you know, one, I spend a lot of time with the marketing team because I'm usually on, on, on like sales events and things like that. And like, I just absolutely love, like, after you spend all day, you know, in a booth or in some meeting with, with docs or some sort of presentation. Like going afterwards and just talking about the day and commiserating with your folks at the bar. And it's, yeah. it's way later than you should be staying up. And but I mean, you're all you're all so passionate about what yeah. just happened and what the product is and, and the way things you want to solve. Uh, and that's great. And it's one of those things where it's like I feel like like I want to go out with the folks from work. And it's like it's like, but they probably should want to go out. They should probably want to go home and, and be with their family, <laughs> and have their personal. Life. So all I want to do is talk about what just happened. Yeah. Right. Or I want to talk or about figure out how to make it better, or like what yeah. went wrong, or, or just yeah. kind of keep work yeah. business it, leisure. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those things where it's just like, man, we should we not be talking? Should we not be talking so much about work? But like, you know, I, I really enjoy that time. And, and and with with Blue Belt, you know, it was the Road Dogs that were doing presentations and trying to bring services on board, and it was with the Nephew now as the people that are out there just trying to sell in it and, and try to make the product better and, and deal, you know, commiserating about what it's like in a bigger company and all those sorts of things.
but uh, again, it, it's the people that are super passionate and hardworking around around this idea that you have and, and, and that spirit of competition. So it's 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 still fun. That's pretty pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, any anything else? I feel like I feel like we're there, but no, no. I uh, think it's great, and I gotta commend you on on the the tube. Oh, thank uh, you, Nico. The, the, the tube that is excellent. Yeah, uh, and uh, no, it's been, yeah. it, it's been really, it's been cool. Yeah, I definitely got to have you on my podcast. Yeah, if I ever get a podcast, absolutely, I would, I would love to do it. And if you want to come on again too, I, I don't know. I feel like we've kind of done the rounds here, but I feel like we could find you know kind of more subject matter. Yeah, yeah I think that we we could just talk about the Netflix shows that we're talking about instead of listening oh, yeah, to my sure. work history is. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, this was fun, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to chat some more. Um, in the future, absolutely, um, and uh, you know, hang out in this cool space. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah, cool. I appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks,